Hello. Good evening, all. Welcome back to the last talk of the conference. Uh, <laughs> professor Michael Levin is with us, and he is uh, a professor of biology, University of Tufts, USA. And he also holds uh, one year Bush professorship there. He's also uh, the director of Levin Lab and also the director of Allen Discovery Center at Tufts in Bedford, uh, United States. And he's a co founder of uh, and principal investigator of the Institute, of, Institute for Computationally Designed Organisms uh, from 2020 onwards. And he's also a senior research investigator for the Institute, Harvard Update, Department of Molecular Genetics, Cambridge, uh, from 2008 to present. He is uh, going to deliver a lecture titled as Diverse Intelligence, Understanding and Relating to Unconventional biological engineered and hybrid agents. So, I uh, extend a warm welcome to Professor Michael Levin on behalf of uh, the department and the conference organizing team. And uh, thank you, Professor Levin, for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, delivering this lecture. Over to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and. Um... I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, I will do my best. It's 5 a.m. here this morning. I will uh, I will try to be uh, coherent. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, the details of the things I will talk about today, uh, you can find me and uh, all of the primary papers, the data sets, the software. Everything is here at this uh, at this website. And so please please do get in touch if you're interested in any of this. Um, the Traditional picture is is uh, shown uh, here. This is uh, a, a famous painting of um, Adam uh, naming the animals, and it's this this uh, old idea, which is really prevalent in a lot of thinking today, even among scientists, that uh, there are humans and uh, human kind of minds, and then there are many other uh, many other creatures, and that these are distinct, uh, discrete natural kinds. They're just uh, they're just uh, sharply different from each other, and humans have all sorts of cognitive capacities. And if you uh, try to f look for these capacities elsewhere in the natural world, this is often called anthropomorphism, and so some sort of <laughs> inappropriate attribution of this of these magical uh, qualities uh, outside of uh, the human organism. But if we take uh, developmental biology and evolution seriously, we realize that. Uh, so that that bo both on long um, phylogenetic timescales as well as uh, developmental timescales, uh, we all share a continuity of uh, much much different uh, kinds of beings, and so 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 uh, this is this is really a slow a slow continuum, and any sort of uh, special properties that we have, you have to ask <clears throat> where did these properties come from, and. Uh, to what extent uh, did they exist in our various ancestors, and when did they begin or end? If you think that these are uh, but discrete categories and, and and so on, but it's actually even much worse than that, which is that now because we now have the ability to replace uh, components of a living system at all scales, so at the cellular scale, tissue, organism, and so on, we can replace uh, biologically evolved components with all kinds of chimeric engineered materials. So whether this be uh, nano, uh, nanomaterials or uh, 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 edited DNA or various inorganic components, we can, we can make very novel organisms. And so uh, laterally, you can see that there's a potential chain of beings, um, which are and increasingly will be uh, realized, where not only through, through biological changes, but also technological hybridization, there are a very wide range of different types of creatures. And then once again, you have to ask what kind of minds do they have? So um, I have this, this framework that I've been working on. It's called TAME, T-A-M-E, stands for uh, Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere. And the idea is simply this. We need to be able to um, create and relate to truly diverse intelligences, regardless of what they're made of or how they got here. And so that means that we would like this, uh, a single framework on which we can compare and, uh, and understand 
the kinds of cognitive systems that exist in familiar creatures. So we, so so humans, uh, primates, um, uh, but you know, birds, uh, octopus, uh, these kinds of things. But also really uh, unusual creatures, colonial organisms, uh, swarms, and. In, in synthetic biology, so new engineered life forms, um, software, artificial intelligences, and maybe someday exobiological agents realizing that the earth, uh, the all of the examples on earth are just an N of one. And we really have to, uh, we really have to understand broader than that. <laughs> now, uh, a number of people have have tried for such a thing, and so so this was a very nice beginning by um, Rosenbluth, Wiener, and Bigelow, who created this kind of uh, scale that that shows you through some examples of great transitions, all the way from passive behaviors all the way up to what we would call human level cognition with um, uh, you know uh, second order and metacognitive kinds of uh, processes and so on. And and what's interesting about the scale, it's very cybernetic. It's uh, doesn't say anything about neurons or brains or, uh, or or really embodiments. What it what it talks about is is uh, functionality and ways in, in of processing information, and that makes it compatible with all of these things. And I think that's a that's a that's a that's the right approach. <laughs> so what what I'm interested in is uh, developing a framework like this that really uh, is uh, it picks out what are the symmetries, what are the invariants among all of these different kinds of agents. To, uh, to give us new capabilities in the laboratory and to move experimental work forward. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is a nice quote um, from Searle, which says that, uh, that we have to uh, allow ourselves to really um, uh, examine things that, uh, that, that are generally taken for granted. And this is the most common one. This is a really magical process in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in science. It's, it's developmental biology. All of us uh, take this amazing journey across through the Cartesian cut. We start as just physics. So this is an oocyte. <clears throat> this is a, um, a quiescent egg cell prior to fertilization. It's a sort of a blob of, uh, a blob of chemicals. And uh, uh, you, know, you would look at it, then you would say <clears throat> that uh, it's, it's basically just physics. There's not, uh, there's not uh, any, any or not much cognition going on there. But eventually, we become one of these organisms, and maybe something like this, this, this uh, human organism that will make statements about um, being uh, unique and, uh, and, and uh, having a, a, a kind of uh, inner perspective and so on. And the important thing to realize is that this process is extremely slow and gradual. So step by step, developmental biology offers no sharp line at which, uh, boom, prior to that, it was just chemistry and physics, uh, but now, now you're a cognitive being. There, there are no sharp lines in developmental biology. So everything is everything is slow and continuous and somehow this process results in mind emerging from matter and so this is this is maybe one of the most interesting questions that 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 exist and there have been a variety of ways to think about this in particular there's this idea of uh collective intelligence and so people will sometimes say well ants and colonies uh, of of uh, bees and the birds and things like that are um perhaps a a uh, a collective intelligence but but we we are a unified intelligence. We're not like a swarm of of, of ants. We are a collective intelligence. Uh, like we have we have a we have a brain and it's centralized. And and Descartes wanted to find a a center in the brain um, that um, was uh, was 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 specifically uh, specifically uh, connected to this unified experience that we had. But of course. Uh, we are also made of parts, and in fact, all intelligence is collective intelligence. So let's see. So 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 here we are. Here's the brain, and of course, uh, the brain is also made of parts. It's made of cells. These neurons inside of each cell is an incredible number of things uh, that uh, that are that are all operating under various rules to give rise to the the collective behavior, and so. The, the real trick to all of this is to understand the scaling, to understand how the uh, physics and computation of lower level components gives rise to a cognition that appears to be unified. So, so we are also collective intelligences. And so, and so how does collective intelligence work? Let's, uh, let's just take a look at what, what our pieces are. So <clears throat> this, is a, this is a cell. Uh, this uh, happens to be a free living organism, but all of us were once free living organisms. This is a uh, lacrimaria. So there's no brain, there's no nervous system, uh, there's no uh, cell to cell communication, there are no stem cells. This is just a, a single cell doing everything it needs on its own. So you can see it's handling its physiological, its metabolic, its behavioral goals at the level of a single cell. Um, look at uh, the, the, the ability to, uh, to it's, it's feeding, it's eating bacteria and other things in its environment. Uh, this is, you know, the envy of 
soft soft robotics soft robotics and other kinds of uh, engineering we we have nothing that's of, of this level of sophistication so each one of our cells was an independent organism and uh this 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 makes it really important to understand how these capacities these competencies of uh of our subunits add up together to give us what feels like a unified cognitive experience now um one very interesting thing is that uh, so alan turing uh, needs no introduction of course was uh, um, uh, really interested in in intelligence in uh, different embodiments for intelligence in computation these very fundamental things um that uh, he wanted to understand uh, the mind and it's in its most general um, case um but uh one other thing that he he did, which uh, not, some some people are not aware of, is that he was also uh, interested in developmental biology. He 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 wrote a very um uh, very early paper on uh, morphogenesis, the appearance of order, the spontaneous generation of order in chemical in in chemical systems. And so you might wonder uh, why somebody who was interested in intelligence uh, would also be interested in uh, in, in morphogenesis and in, in uh, chemical models of developmental biology. And I think Turing, although to my knowledge he didn't write much about this, I think that he saw quite clearly, being the the genius that he was, I think he saw quite clearly that these are fundamentally the same problem. And I think in a very deep way this is true. I think uh, the the secret of developmental biology and morphogenesis is uh, really, uh, if we understood it properly, would would uh, would really open up uh, all of the mysteries that we're interested in for um, for cognition. I think I think it is the same problem. So today, what what I'd like to tell you today is this. Um, first of all, I would like to tell you that uh, biology uses this kind of multi-scale competency architecture. I'll show you what that is uh, of nested problem solvers in diverse problem spaces. And navigating these problem spaces uh, is a central concept, and I think it's a concept that binds together diverse fields from uh, engineering and autonomous uh, of um, autonomous vehicles all the way through to uh, cognitive science and developmental biology and biomedicine. Uh, I use uh, the notion of goal directedness, and I, I will define that shortly, as a kind of invariant to recognize, create, and co control or communicate with agents and unconventional embodiments. And I'm going to show you this, this cognitive boundary model for the scaling of cognition. I'm going to um, spend some time talking about a specific example. I want, I want to take apart in, in detail a specific example of uh, an unconventional intelligence and how do we work with something like this. Uh, I'm going to talk about the collective intelligence of morphogenesis of cells, groups of cells navigating anatomical space. And I'm going to show you that bioelectric networks are a kind of protocognitive medium which is also the ancestor of, of, of brain function. And this has, this has huge impact on, on biomedicine that I think is going to allow us to do something very different than today's uh, molecular medicine approaches. And I'm going to close with uh, pointing out again that synthetic bioengineering is giving us an, a, a, an enormously large option space of new bodies and new minds, which are going to exist, and some of them already do. These have no standard evolutionary backstories, and this has many implications for uh, not only understanding evolution and, and biomedicine, but also um, AI, robotics, and ethics, uh, very importantly. So in my, um, <clears throat> in my uh, uh, framework, one of the things we focus on, this is a very engineering-based uh, approach because I want to be uh, close to experiments. I want all of these philosophical ideas to be testable empirically. I want them to generate new work. And so this is, this is an, an, an engineering approach. And the engineering approach is simply this, that uh, we can place all these all these uh, diverse beings on a continuum that exists with respect to persuadability meaning what technology or approaches or techniques or strategies would you use to control the system right so that's that's the engineering approach and so you can see immediately that all kinds of diverse systems land on this on the spectrum so you can have very simple um mechanical systems like like a like a mechanical clock that are sort of on the left of that continuum and the thing is that if you wanted to control this system uh you will not uh, program it you will not convince it of anything all you can do is modify the hardware okay um and then you have more interesting systems like like uh, homeostatic systems where uh actually you don't need to rewire the hardware but you can reset the set point and then this thing will will have different behaviors and then you can move from that to systems whether living or non-living that are able to learn and you can train them with uh, rewards and punishments and various uh, behavioral paradigms and then eventually you get to systems that you don't even need to reward and punish directly you can communicate with uh with with reasoning and 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 perhaps get them to do things and so 
you can see as 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 we move from from this idea that 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 here's hard that here's modification at the level of hardware to eventually you get to something that that sure it's hardware but but really the most efficient way of dealing with it is basically through some something that in in the in human terms looks like psychotherapy which is just very very high level uh communication to try and uh, try and control what happens okay so the first thing i'm going to do here <clears throat> for the next few minutes is try to uh, show you some unusual biology uh to um really reinforce this idea that that that, that everything lives on a continuum and that we have to understand how uh, agents change along that uh, along that continuum. So the first thing I want to uh, talk about is is this. So so here is a is a creature. This is a caterpillar. Uh, caterpillars live in a two dimensional world of surfaces. They crawl on uh, on these these uh, flat structures they, and they eat uh, they they eat the leaves and they have a particular brain that's uh, highly specialized for doing that. But they need to turn into this uh, this kind of creature, which is completely different. This this one lives in a three dimensional world. It doesn't care about the leaves at all. It drinks uh, nectar, and it has a different life, and it has a different brain that's uh, well well suited for its uh, for for its environment. Now, the way you get from here to there is through a process of metamorphosis, and during this process, this guy basically dissolves its brain. So so most of the connections are broken. Many of the cells die. The brain is then reassembled from this state to this state. And two two interesting things uh, from 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 this this process. The first is that you know in 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 philosophy 101 you might be challenged to ask what's it like to be a butterfly or what's it like to be a caterpillar. Well, this is uh, the next uh, sort of meta question, which is what's it like to be a caterpillar slowly changing into a butterfly right so this is a this is a radical change of your embodiment of your existence in the physical world that occurs during your lifetime not during evolutionary time scales but literally during your your uh, your lifetime so um so that's that's kind of an interesting question what happens to you uh but now the other important point because you might be tempted to say well you disappear and then there's a new creature so basically there is no transition but actually that's that's not the case because um under the most common uh criterion for personal identity which is memories to to uh, reta retaining your personal memories it turns out that memories are retained through this process so there's there's pretty good evidence that that uh caterpillars that learn something that are trained uh the 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 moth or butterfly remembers the original information so to some extent and this is this raises interesting philosophical puzzles so, so to some extent it is in fact the same organism in a new body so this is this is a an, an, an interesting kind of um, re re rebirth but but of the same organism in a new body now this is even uh, in these animals this is even uh, this is even even uh, more more apparent that these are planaria these are flatworms which I'll talk about more in the rest of the talk but the key feature of planarians is that they regenerate so if you cut them into pieces every piece will give rise to a new worm and they have a brain up here uh, a true centralized brain uh, with uh, the same neurotransmitters that you and I have and uh, you can cut off the head and they will regenerate but the amazing thing and this was discovered in uh, by um, uh, James McConnell and and we um, replicated his work using modern uh, automation in 2013 what he discovered is if, the, if you train this animal uh, then you cut off the head the tail sits there doing nothing for about a week they eventually regrows a new brain and when it regrows a new head and brain you can show that they remember the original information and so so they learn they learn that food is to be found on these on these little um these little laser etched discs now <clears throat> This allows you to 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 perform an experiment again from from philosophy of mind, which is called the malfunction malfunctioning transporter. So the idea that you know, let's say let's say there's a transporter that that somehow transports you from here to there, but it's broken down, and so once it's transported you, it it fails to remove the original copy. So now there's two of you, and so so which one is the original um, is the original person? So so in the planarian, you can actually do that. We can cut it in, into pieces, and now you have multiple individuals that are basically copies of the original as far as the content of their of their brains uh, are concerned so you can see this this amazing plasticity that uh where where the the ability to to change the body in this case to regrow a head or to metamorphose and, and rebuild a brain is 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 deeply connected with the um cognitive content of of that of that creature's mind and and this this plasticity of uh, plasticity of the body extends to vertebrates so here is a tadpole of a frog. So here are the nostrils, the mouth, um, the brain, the gut here, and this is the tail back here. And so what you'll notice what we've done here is we've created uh, a, a tadpole in which 
the, pri the eyes are missing, so there's no eyes up here, but we did create an eye on its tail, and I'll talk later about how, how we do that. But these animals, when you create this eye without uh, long periods of evolutionary adaptation, they can see, they can see out of this eye. And we know that because this device that we've built, and it's the same uh, device that we use to uh, train uh, to test to, to train and test the the planarian during their behavior studies we can show that that these these animals can be trained on visual uh, tasks um, and to stay away from particular moving lights and, and things like that so so this is uh, this is this is amazing because the brain dynamically adjusts its behavioral programs to accommodate a completely different body architecture so uh, and this has this has many uh, many implications for evolution that uh, that we can talk about later if, if people want to. But but that that plasticity of you know how is it that cells uh, eye precursor cells uh, implanted onto the tail not only make a perfectly normal eye even though they're in a weird uh, environment with muscle next to them and so on they make a perfectly normal eye but they figure out how to connect and they don't connect to the brain they connect here to the spinal cord for example and that information is is able to be picked up by the brain so 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 that um that competency of the parts is um uh is really quite uh, quite quite remarkable and so what this gets us to is 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 this uh that Biological organisms are not merely um, nested dolls structurally. So we all know, you know, we're made of organs, of tissues, cells, molecules. Not just not not just structurally, but uh, functionally. Each of these independent layers is uh, is is solving problems. It's a, it's an independent. It's 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 independently competent in solving various problems. And uh, and this is happening simultaneously at all scales of organization. Now, what are these problems that it's solving? Well. We're pretty used to uh, recognizing intelligent uh, activity in the in the three in three dimensional space. So our cognitive and uh, sensory structures are primed to uh, look for medium sized objects moving at medium speeds through three dimensional space and doing clever things like like uh, like this uh, crow that's learned to pick up cigarette butts to receive a reward. Um, but imagine if we had uh, the innate sense of uh, really feeling every uh, all the all the parameters of your blood chemistry, for example. If we had an in, innate uh, feeling of that, much like we see uh, the outside world, I think we would have no problem recognizing, for example, that our liver, our kidneys, our various organs are uh, performing very interesting uh, uh, intelligent behaviors in adjusting to all these circuit to all these novel circumstances in physiological space. So there are there are numerous other problem spaces that we're simply not uh, not used to. Uh, but but these these spaces are ones in which uh, uh, intelligence can be manifest in exactly the same way that it can be manifest in three dimensional space. We just have to learn to think about these. So so what are these spaces? So there are spaces of um, physiological uh, physiological parameters. There are spaces of a transcriptional, meaning gene expression, right? So a separate dimension for every gene, and then you have this huge dimensional, um, a huge dimensional manifold in which in which every cell is is navigating as it as it changes its uh, its transcriptional states. And we have this, which is sort of my favorite, and what I'll spend the most time um, talking about, which is anatomical morphous space, the 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 space of all possible shapes. For example, the possible the, the parameter space that defines different shapes of planarian heads. So before we launch into um, into morphous space, I want to give you one example of transcriptional and physiological space that we discovered a couple of years ago. So here's a here's our planarian, and what we've done is we we take this uh, we take this flatworm and we put it into a solution of barium barium chloride. Barium is a is an interesting chemical. Barium blocks all of the potassium channels, and when you block all the potassium channels, uh, cells uh, which rely on potassium flux to manage their physiology become extremely unhappy. In fact, the 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 planarian head has so many uh, uh, neurons that require this, the whole head explodes. Literally, they just over overnight they that the, the head explodes. They lose their head. But the amazing thing is that if you keep them in barium, what they will do over uh, over the next week or two is they will grow a new head. And the new head is is, is completely uh, adapted to barium. Uh, has no problem with barium whatsoever. They're fine. And so we asked a very simple question: uh, How is that possible? How what what is this what is this head doing that's different from the original head that allows it to uh, allows it to uh, maintain uh, its uh, function in, um, uh, in barium? Um, I'm sorry. Could somebody could somebody mute? Uh, I, there's a, there's a lot of noise from uh, somebody. Uh, 
Yep, there we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, we what we did was we uh, compared the transcriptomes. So uh, we just looked at all of the genes that are expressed in these in these uh, normal heads versus the ones that are expressed here, and we asked what's different. So what's what's uh, transcriptionally different about these uh, uh, about these animals? And what we found is it's really a very small number of genes that were turned on to allow them to adapt to barium. Now here's the amazing thing: Planaria never encounter barium in nature. So there, there has never been evolutionary pressure for being able to deal with, with barium exposure and for knowing what to do when you're in barium. How did these cells know exactly which genes to turn on to deal with this new physiological stressor? So you can sort of imagine this problem. It's because, because there, I don't know, 20,000 genes or however many there are. You can imagine it's like you're, you're in a, a, a nuclear reactor control room. It's, it's melting down. There's a big problem. Uh, how do you know what to do? And in, in fact, you can't, there's no time to just start flipping genes randomly on and off. There's no time for that. Um, the cells don't, don't turn over like bacteria. So there's no time for uh, some kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, random change where everything dies and the one successful cell repopulates the head. And so uh, there's this real, real problem of understanding how do these cells navigate to the correct region of transcriptional space. They have to, they have to take this walk from, from from this state to 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 this state, and it's and it's not known how how they do that. So that's an example of problem solving uh, in in physiological space. But what I'd like to do next is to really focus on morphogenesis and and problem solving in anatomical space as a kind of uh, collective intelligence. And so so let's talk about this for for a few minutes. Uh, we all uh, start life like this as a as a ball of uh, embryonic blastomeres. So. Um, this is uh, this is kind of an early an early stage, and these cells eventually build something like this. This is a cross section through the human torso, and you can see the amazing order here, the structure. Every every organ and tissue is in the right place, the right size, uh, the right position relative to each other. W where is this structure specified? Where is this order specified? Now, people often will want to say, "Well, it's in the DNA," but we can read genomes now, and none of this is directly in the DNA. What the DNA specifies is the micro level hardware of each cell. So the proteins that every cell gets to have, but it's the physiology and the, um, and the dynamic behavior of these cells that then gives rise to the right number of fingers, eyes, and, and everything else. So we have to understand how do cells, it's groups of cells know what to make and when to stop. Um, as workers in regenerative medicine, we would like to know, well, if a piece of this is missing, how do we get these cells to rebuild again? And as engineers, we would like to ask a further question, which is, well, that's fine to regenerate this, but actually what else can we make? So, so can we, can we uh, ask these cells to build something completely different? And I'll show you that towards the end of the talk. So um, well, I like to think about uh, the, the end game of this, of this field, specifically of regenerative medicine, with a concept um, of, of an anatomical compiler. An anatomical compiler is, a, is, a, is, a future, is, a, is an aspirational future system where what you should be able to do is sit down in front of a computer and draw the animal or plant that you want. Um, it could be anything. It could be, it could be a, a typical one. It could be some sort of hybrid. It could be anything you like. And if we knew what we were doing and we understood we had a mature uh, science of morphogenesis, what the system would be able to do is output a set of stimuli that you could give to a group of cells and they would build exactly what you asked for, right? So, so an anatomical compiler. Now, now notice that the, an, I'm going to argue that an anatomical compiler is not a 3D printer. You are not micromanaging the positions of individual cells and trying to print it. What, what it really is deeply is a communication device. It's a translator from, from, from your uh, desired three-dimensional shape to the signals that need to be given by the cellular collective to uh, cause that collective to build it in exactly the same way that it normally builds something else. And so now why do we need this? Well, we need it because, because uh, most problems of biomedicine, with the exception of infectious disease, most problems of biomedicine boil down to uh, the control of shape. So birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, all of this would be solved if we knew how to convince a group of cells to do what we want them to do. So now, now, now we have molecular biology and genetics. Uh, so, so isn't that isn't that enough? Uh, how you know? Well, what else do we need? Well, here's a very simple example. Um, this is an axolotl larva. So these are salamanders, and baby axolotls have little little legs. This is a tadpole of a frog. Frog tadpoles do not have legs. And in our lab, we can do something like um, make a chimera called uh, a frogolotl. So we can mix the early cells. We can make a chimeric embryo called a frogolotl. 
Now I ask a simple question. Well, will the frog allotl have legs or not? We have both genomes. You have the axolotl genome. You have the frog genome. Can you tell me if the frog allotl is going to have legs? And the answer is no. We have we have absolutely no uh, uh, frameworks currently to uh, to be able to 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 determine this this kind of the anatomical information, even though you have the full genetics for both animal. And so where we are now is this: we're very good molecular biology and medicine are very good at manipulating pathways, so cells and molecules. But we're really quite a long way to uh, from from controlling form and function, which is what what we want. And my argument is that uh, in in biomedicine, we are basically where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. That it was still basically stuck at the hardware level. Everything is about um, pathways and molecules and genome editing, and that this this is all at the level of hardware. But we really have an opportunity, which is to exploit something remarkable that exists in, in biology and, and, and also in some computer systems, which is um, higher level information processing. And in biology, we call this agency. And so I want to uh, uh, give a definition of what I'm talking about. That I, and, and I like this uh, William James's definition, which is uh, for intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. Um, somebody else uh, put it, and I wish I could remember who, who said this, somebody else said that, uh, it's it's the it's the it's the continuum of different capacities be, that that make the difference between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together. It's the degree of sophistication you can expect from a system in meeting uh, meeting a specific goal, which looks like maybe energy minimization in very simple systems, and and it looks uh, somewhat different in complex systems. So so how does intelligence work out in uh, in in morphogenesis? Well, here's a simple example. So okay, so so we know that development is extremely reliable. So so almost all of the time, uh, an embryo will give rise to a proper uh, proper a proper human body. But actually, um, it's reliable, but it's uh, it's robust. It's not hardwired. So if we take an early embryo and we cut it in half, you don't get two half bodies. You get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And 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 development in general has this ability to reach the same. Uh, goal, uh, meaning the same the same state in anatomical morphous space from different starting positions, and despite various perturbations like these local maxima that um, where 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 hardwired systems would simply get stuck, the way two magnets trying to get together would just be forever stuck. If you put a barrier in their place, they're never going to walk around it. They're just going to um, uh, try to try to get together in the direct path. Development isn't like that, and um, regeneration isn't like that either. So so here's a salamander. Um, this, this guy, uh, this is called the axolotl, and these guys will regenerate their legs, their eyes, their jaws, uh, various internal organs. So if you amputate, uh, uh, for example, anywhere along this, uh, this limb, they will grow exactly what's needed, and then they will stop. The stopping is the, is the most amazing part. Um, when do they stop? They stop when the correct large-scale anatomy is complete. So the system as a whole knows exactly what a salamander, what a normal salamander looks like, uh, and and anywhere you cut, it'll grow just the right amount, and it'll stop at the right time. So this is an example of anatomical homeostasis, or the the ability to return back to that region of anatomical morphous space when it's been perturbed away from it. I should say that this is not just some weird um, uh, capacity of lower organisms. Human uh, human livers are highly regenerative. Human children will regrow their fingertips. And uh, deer regrow uh, uh, large amounts of bone uh, innervation, vasculature, and so on every year. So, so uh, there's all kinds of uh, capacities for that regeneration. But one of the one of the most amazing and one of my favorite examples is 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 this. And this was this was discovered back in the 1940s. Uh, this is a cross section through a um, uh, a kidney tubule in a in a newt. And what you see is that there's eight or ten cells that cooperate together to build this kind of uh, this kind of tubular structure. Now, one thing you can do is you can you can force these cells to be much larger. And when you do that, uh, when the cells get larger, the newt stays the same, the same size. So so it has a regular regulatory regulative uh, ability, and remarkably, then uh, just a fewer number of cells are being used, but they make the same structure. And the most amazing thing happens when you make these cells so enormous that uh, what it does is one cell will bend around itself to uh, to form a uh, to form the, the exact same structure. Now, what's remarkable about this is that this is a completely different molecular mechanism. This is cell to cell communication and tubulogenesis. This is cytoskeletal bending. So, what you have here is a nice example of top down causation in the service of a large scale anatomical goal, making a proper tubule of the right shape and size. Different molecular mechanisms will get called up. 
in this case, cytoskeleton uh, bending, in this case, cell to cell, uh, cell to cell interactions. Different molecular mechanisms get called up to, uh, to, to serve this, this high level anatomical goal. And so we can see this, this kind of a multi scale. So, th so this is, of course, very, very much uh, what, what cognitive architectures do, right? You have, you have um, a high level. Um, uh, high level executive function of some sort, and that that eventually feeds down to physiological processes and and, and making um, your muscles move and so on. and and uh, this is this is an, another uh, really nice uh, example which we discovered a few years ago, which is which is this that um these again, this is a tadpole, so the eyes, the brain, and so on. These tadpoles need to become frogs. And in order to become frogs, they have to rearrange their face. So the jaws have to move, the eyes have to move, everything has to move around. And it was thought that this was a hardwired process, uh, meaning meaning uh, every organ just moved in the right direction, the right amount, and then you go from a normal tadpole to a normal frog. So we decided to test the idea that um, uh, that this process was had had very low intelligence and basically just was a, was a hardwired set of movements. So what we did was we scrambled all of the initial starting positions. So we made this the, these these Picasso what we call these Picasso tadpoles, where all the organs are in the wrong place. And what happens is that actually they still make pretty normal frogs. Everything moves around in novel paths. Sometimes they go too far and they actually have to come back, but everything moves around until they get to their normal position and then they stop. So this is very interesting. The system is not just a set of hardwired movements. It can actually do the same. It, it can reach the same goal despite this, 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 this perturbation. And what the genetics gives you is, is not a, a hardwired machine. What it gives you is an, a, an error minimization scheme. It gives you a system that executes a very flexible program that can start off in different starting positions and still get to where it needs to go through novel actions that are not normally taken through development. So, so this kind of this kind of uh, navigation of morphospace with different um, uh, competencies is is exactly what we're looking for as a uh, as an invariant uh, across a really uh, really diverse uh, problem solving systems. So. We we um, we started to think about this this process as this kind of homeostatic loop, like a simple homeostat on that on that initial scale that I that I showed you from a, a Wiener and um, and colleagues. So the idea is that this 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 here is the typical developmental uh, story that uh, that that you get in textbooks where you have gene regulatory um, networks. Um, they the genes turn each other on and off, and you get some proteins that interact according to the laws of physics. So this is a kind of a complex, uh, complex dynamical system. And then through the magical process of emergence, you get a complex outcome. You get you get something like this. And 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 that's true. All of that does does happen. But the more amazing part of it is that actually this is not a purely feed forward emergent process. What you actually have is a set of control loops that will be activated if you deviate from this target state. So, so that means injury, mutation, teratogenesis, whatever. If you uh, cancer, if you deviate from the state, then uh, both at the at the level of uh, transcription at the level of physics. Uh, actions will be taken to try to get the system back to where it needs to be. So basic homeostasis. Now, um, here's the thing. In, in biology uh, and medicine, we're very used to homeostatic uh, circuits. So, so that's, that's no big surprise uh, for temperature and pH and things like that. However, two things are unusual here. One is that in those kind of systems, the, 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 set, the set point is, is the parameter is a scalar. It's a single number, you know, pH temperature, something, a metabolic state, something like that. But here, what we're saying is the set point is actually some kind of coarse grained anatomical descriptor. So the set point is complex here. It's not a, it's not a single number. It's a, it's a, it's a shape descriptor. And so that, that's unusual. And the other thing is that because this has, this has this, the cybernetic flavor of error minimization, it's um it's very much a goal directed system in the in the in the formal uh, uh, engineering control theory sense of a goal. It's a it's a state towards which the system can repair, use energy to try to get back to that state despite perturbations. And so so that that's kind of unusual because because in in molecular biology and 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 fields like that, you're not supposed to talk about goals. You're only supposed to talk about feed forward emergence. And I think that's a big um, that's a big miss uh, for for uh, for for those kind of approaches. So uh, this way of thinking, this unusual way of thinking about it makes a couple of very strong predictions. The first thing it says is that, well, if this is true, it has to have an explicit encoding of the goal state. Uh, every thermostat has a set point to be recorded somewhere. And in order to have this kind of homeostatic circuit, you need to be able to know what the set point is. And so somewhere you have to store the actual memory of what the correct salamander looks like. That, that's quite unusual. 
And, uh, and if that's true, the prediction is, is, is twofold. First of all, that you should be able to find it, you should be able to decode it, and you should be able to rewrite it. And, and the other big thing about this is that if you do that, that's a completely different way of, of, of controlling the system than the traditional bottom-up uh, molecular biology approach. Because uh, if, if this was an emergent system, then your only hope was, was to somehow figure out what to do down here. Which genes do I alter? So, so for example, if we decided that we wanted um, more, more fingers or we wanted this to have threefold symmetry instead of bilateral symmetry, can you figure out which genes need to be changed to make that happen? And the answer is we have no idea how to, how to, how to do that. But, um, but, but there's potentially another approach. Let's leave, this, the, let's leave the hardware alone, the way you would do with a thermostat, and, and change the set point. Can we decode that set point and get the exact same cells to build something completely different? And so what I'm going to show you now is, is our, efforts, um, uh, our efforts to do that, because we've basically uh, uncovered the idea that uh, the informational medium for this collective intelligence, this, this, these groups of cells that do these amazing things and repair and, 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 and so on, uh, there, there, is, there is a kind of cognitive glue that allows them to do that, that binds the individual cells into a single uh, agent that has goals in morphospace. And that glue is uh, perhaps not shocking because that's what, uh, that's what happens in the brain. Um, that mechanism is, is developmental bioelectricity. So let's so so let's look at um, let's look at brains as an example of a uh, biological system in which uh, this kind of problem solving capacity exists. How do brains solve problems in in three dimensional space? Well, the hardware looks like this. So it's a network of of cells connected to each other. Each cell has these little ion channel proteins that allow the cell to uh, maintain different uh, voltage potentials, and that electrical state can be propagated to the neighbors through these little electrical synapses known as gap junctions. And, and so that kind of hardware uh, is known to um, support an amazing kind of behavioral software. So you see this here, this, this, this group made this amazing video of uh, electrical activity in a zebrafish brain and a living zebrafish brain as fish um, think about whatever it is that fish think about. And this drives a, um, uh, this drives a process of, uh, or a project of neural decoding. So the idea is that if we record all of this activity and we learn to decode it, we will be able to uh, read out the, 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 the mental states, the goals, the preferences, um, you know, uh, uh, everything else about this, about the, 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 the mental life of the system, because it is a commitment of neuroscience that uh, all of the cognitive content of the of the of the organism is is stored and uh, and implemented by the brain physiology here so it turns out so 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 that's the that's the that's the standard um neuroscience story but it turns out that neuroscience is actually applicable way beyond neurons because all of the cells in your body have ion channels most of them have gap junctions to their neighbors and so what we've started is the this idea this parallel idea of, of non-neural decoding where we can take a look this happens to be a frog embryo developing same same technology imaging the electrical conversations that these cells have with each other uh, we should be able to decode this and from there derive all of the protocognitive capacities that the system is using to navigate anatomical space and becoming a proper embryo. What does the collective measure? What does it remember? What does it know? What errors does it try to minimize? Um, all of these things we should be able to discover if we knew how to crack this bioelectric code. And so, so the, the interesting thing is that it's extremely this, this, this architecture of brain and behavior, right, where, where uh, the DNA uh, specifies the, 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 the electrical components, and then you have this, this um, uh, excitable medium that, uh, with, with certain architectures that then supports uh, behavior, which you can, you can affect. Not, not just by editing the DNA, but with experience, with, 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 uh, with electrical signals, through, the, through sensory organs, with drugs. And what it does is it controls your muscles electrically to move the body through three-dimensional space. But of course, this system is evolutionarily ancient. This was used long before brains and um, neurons appeared. Even, even uh, bacterial biofilms already knew how to do this. What it does is, the, is, is uses the exact same, it exploits the exact same computational capacities of electrical networks to make decisions collectively that move your body shape through 
anatomical morphous space. So it controls your journey, not through physical space, but through anatomical space before you have a brain and muscles and, and, and all of that. And this is, this is not only evolutionarily ancient, but developmentally extremely, um, extremely early. So there's a really strong isomorphism here because evolution, of course, likes to, likes to um, reuse things. And, and we think that what it did was, was simply pivot the same set of tricks into different effectors and thus into different problem spaces. Um, and so, so here are some tools we developed. Um, uh, we developed uh, these, these voltage sensitive dyes that allow us to track all the electrical states of, for example, an early embryo. So here's a time lapse taken by my colleague, Danny Adams. We do a lot of computational modeling to link it to the molecular biology of these ion channels to figure out which channels and pumps are responsible for the states of individual cells. And then, of course, is the hard work of doing the systems uh, f physiology of figuring out what the, uh, what the patterns mean. So I'm going to show you two examples of these patterns. This is, uh, this is a voltage movie taken of an early frog embryo, putting its face together. And uh, you can see here that um, uh, this is one frame out of that movie that basically we can now read out the pattern memory that these cells have of what a normal face looks like. So before all the genes come on and all the cells become rearranged and everything, this is, you can already see the tissue knows, here's where the mouth is going to go, here's where the first eye is going to go, the second eye comes later, here are the placodes. Uh, you can, we can already read out these pattern memories. Now, this is, we know these are instructive because if you change this using optogenetics or various other techniques I'm gonna show you in a minute, Everything goes go everything that downstream has changed. The gene expression has changed. The the um, uh, uh, the position of the organs change, and and so on. This is the this is the reference point that serves as the representation for 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 making the uh, this uh, this embryo. Now now that's that's the native one required for normal development. Here's a pathological one, um, and and I'll talk a little bit about more about this later. But but basically the idea that that what we can do is we can inject human oncogenes into these tadpoles. They make little tumors, but even before the tumor becomes morphologically apparent, you can already see the bioelectrical changes that happen as this this oncogene causes these cells to disconnect electrically from their environment and uh, go off and live as amoebas, uh, treating the rest of the body as just ex uh, just external world. So it breaks the connection of these cells to this global bioelectrical pattern. The collective intelligence is, 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 is broken here. So um, to, to, to do these functional experiments, to manipulate these things, we've developed two kinds of tools, basically just uh, everything uh, uh, sort of stolen from neuroscience and, 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 and appropriated to other cells. And that's a very important point. None of the techniques of neuroscience distinguish between neurons and other cells. Everything works. Uh, all the concepts uh, from, from active inference to uh, by about per perceptual bistability to um, uh, rewritability of memory, all, all these things work. And, and the, the actual tools work. So, so we use all the, same, all the same techniques. We use optogenetics. We use uh, neurotransmitter drugs, ion channel drugs. All the same stuff works. Um, now, now, keep in mind, in the things I'm going to show you, there are no electrical fields being applied. There are no uh, waves or magnets or radiation, no, nothing like that. All we do is control the native interface, the native bioelectrical interface that um, these uh, uh, that these cells expose to each other to allow them to program each other's behavior. And that interface, of course, are these gap junctions and these ion channels. So we use drugs, we use, uh, we use um, light as in optogenetics, we can change the structure of these channels and so on. And so it's a, to, to change, and so what we're trying to do is change the resting potential, and in particular, the spatial pattern of resting potential. This is not a single cell phenomenon. This is a, a network phenomenon. So what happens when you do this? Well, one thing that can happen is that if we, if we put in, if we inject into the early embryo an uh, mRNA encoding a specific ion channel that will cause a pattern that's similar to the pattern that we saw in the electric face that I just showed you, we can induce those cells to form an eye. And so we can make an eye anywhere, not just in the anterior neurectoderm, which is where the textbooks will tell you the only tissue competent to become an eye are. So that's not true. If you go, go far upstream of master eye genes like PAC6 and, and set the correct electrical state, you can convince any region of the body to make an eye. For example, the gut here. Okay. And so if you section these eyes, they have all the same uh, components that normal eyes do. So, so here are your um, lens, your retina, your optic, uh, your optic nerve. All of that is is here, and and so so uh, so notice notice a couple of interesting things. First of all, this this shows you that these bioelectrical patterns are instructive. They don't just make uh, they, they they're not just epiphenomena. They don't just make defects. They're actually instructive for for large scale pattern. 
Also notice the modular control. This electrical state that says build an eye here is basically a subroutine call. We don't provide all the information needed to uh, to make an eye. It's a very simple electrical state. That's that's a that, that's a simple state. Downstream, all the complexity of actually carrying it out does not have to be micromanaged. That's very interesting. And they have an interesting capacity that is seen, for example, in ant colonies, which is recruitment. If I only inject a small number of cells, not enough to make this whole lens. This whole thing is a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere. If I only inject a few cells, what they do is they recruit their neighbors. So the blue cells are the ones whose voltage we changed. These other cells, we never targeted them. They're completely wild type. They become recruited to this process of making this uh, very nice lens. So they have the ability to recruit their neighbors to handle a task that there's not enough of them to do that. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, capacity of collective intelligence. What can you? Uh, what can we make? Well, we can make um, uh, ectopic hearts. We can make legs. So here's our six-legged frog. Uh, we can make ectopic forebrains using this technique. We can make inner ear organs or otocysts. We can also make fins. Now that's kind of weird because tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. That's more of a fish thing. But I'll show you what, what's what's going on here in a minute. Um, so 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 whole whole organs can be respecified. Again, we're 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 programming the collective. We're not telling individual stem cells what uh, tissue to be. We're telling a whole region, you should be an eye and, or, or a leg or something else. And, and what is an eye or a leg? Individual cells uh, don't have any way of representing that, but collectives do. And the way they represent it is through these electrical signals. Now, now biomedically, of course, uh, we're, we're using this now to, uh, to, to try to uh, uh, achieve uh, certain goals in regenerative medicine. So here's our leg regeneration project. So frogs normally do not regenerate their legs, unlike salamanders. Um, if you amputate 45 days later, there's uh, at this stage, there's basically nothing. But what we've done is we've created a bioelectrical uh, cocktail that when you apply to the early wound, uh, shifts the decision making of that collective towards a leg regenerating uh, uh, goal. And there and, and then uh, so so it's just a um, a single day treatment, and then you get uh, about a year of leg growth. And by 45 days, already here are your here's this uh, MSX1 um, uh, 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 blastema marker that the, the, the blastema genes are turned on. And then by 45 days, you've already got some toenail, uh, you've got a toenail, you've got some toes, and eventually a quite respectable leg. And the leg is, you can see here, it's touch sensitive, and it's motile. So the animal can use can use this like okay so so again it's this idea of, of communicating a, a very simple thing to the collective and then taking your hands off the wheel not trying to micromanage what the stem cells do or 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 what the gene expression is all of that is handled top down the idea is to give the the appropriate uh, information at the very beginning and i have to i have to do a disclosure here because um David Kaplan and I are co-founders of a, a scientific co-founders of a company called Morphoceuticals, which is trying now the same technology in mammals. And the idea is to ultimately go to uh, limb and organ regeneration in human patients someday. So um, I want to go back to this uh, to this amazing amazing creature, which are these uh, these planaria, and really think about uh, uh, try to try to really uh, cash out this idea that that these electrical, uh, much like in the brain, this electrical um, network. Is really uh, storing the, uh, the the goals and the and the and the and the informational content of the collective intelligence, and so, and just to introduce you to this to this creature a little bit, uh, quite complex, many different organs, a true brain. You can chop them into pieces, and every piece knows exactly what's needed to form a perfect little worm. In fact, they are so good at maintaining the correct shape that they do this all the time in their bodies and thus are immortal. There's no such thing as an old planarian. Uh, they, um, they don't age at the level of the organism. They just keep going. Um, and, and you know that, 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 that they have to have a very developed uh, uh, system of, of uh, global communication because if you cut them in half, this half becomes a tail. This, these cells up here form a head, but these cells were direct neighbors a moment ago. So that decision to make a head or a tail can't be locally determined in these cells. They have to communicate with the rest of the body. Do we already have a head? Which way is the wound facing? And then they make their decision. So understanding this, this decision-making process was really key for us. Um, we developed a, a model of, 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 of bioelectrical signaling at the wound that appears to be involved in that head-tail decision. And that allows you to do the following thing. Uh, here's a normal planarian, one head, one tail. It has normal gene expression, anterior genes in, it turned on in the head. And then when you amputate this guy, you get 100% of the time, you get a one-headed offspring from this, from this middle, middle fragment. But what you can also do is you can also take one of these 
Again, same thing, anatomically normal, uh, transcriptionally normal, and it makes a two-headed worm. This is not Photoshop. These are real, um, real animals. And you ask, well, why is it that uh, I just told you that this was an incredibly reliable process? Why did this guy form an ectopic head at the posterior? Because having figured out this electrical circuit, we were able to rewrite their pattern memory of what a correct planarian is supposed to look like. So here is what this animal represents as a normal planarian, one head, one tail. This is again, voltage, um, voltage imaging. But we were able to, and this is of course somewhat messy, but the, the technique is, is being uh, worked out. We were able to change that electrical pattern by acting on the ion channels and the gap junctions uh, to be to store this, two heads. And then when you cut that animal, it makes a two-headed worm. Now, this is really critical. This electrical map is not an electrical map of this animal. This electrical map is a map of this perfectly normal, anatomically one-headed animal. That, and this is an electrical memory that is latent. It's not doing anything. This animal, it doesn't match the anatomy. The, the idea of I should be two-headed does not match the current state, which is one-headed. That memory is latent because we, we rewrote it, but nothing happens until you injure the animal. Once you injure the animal and cut, and, and, and cut off this middle fragment, then it consults that memory and then it becomes two-headed. So this is, if you're interested in neuroscience and, and our, our brain's amazing ability for what they call time travel, the ability to uh, store and imagine states that are not true right now. So either things that were true or things that might be true later, but are not true right now. I think this is a good example of a, of a very basic um, kind of... Um, primitive version of this because this tissue can store a bioelectrical pattern of what it will do if it gets injured in the future it's a counterfactual memory it's not true right now and so a single planarian body can store up to two different ideas of what a correct planarian should look like and so i promised you earlier on that that i would show you that that um th we can find and edit the the cognitive medium of this collective intelligence of morphogenesis and here it is when we ask where is the information that guides uh, what you build th th here it is it's 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 a, it's uh represented much like in the brain by stable electrical states in the in the tissue that guide the activity and no doubt there's more than two but this is this is what we've worked out now i, I keep calling it a memory why because we 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 also found out that if you take these two uh, two-headed worms um, and, and here they are, so you can see, you can see the video of, of, of them live. If we take these two-headed worms and we continue cutting them in plain water, no more manipulation of any kind, this middle portion will continue to regrow two-headed worms, even though their genetics is completely untouched. So well, let me, let me re re reiterate that. There's nothing genetically wrong with these animals. We did not change the hardware at all. What we changed very with is was a, using a very brief physiological manipulation of the electrical state, basically a stimulus, right? We we communicated uh, to this collective intelligence with an with a brief physiological stimulus of, of turning the channels on and off, the way that it happens, for example, in your retina when you see stimuli. We've communicated the idea that there should be two heads instead of one, and once you do this, the circuit holds that memory, and in the future with no more manipulation, despite the wild type genetics, it will continue to generate a completely different uh, anatomy. And so the question, uh, but, but, you know, the deep question of what determines how many heads you have, you can't simply say DNA. What the DNA does is gives you a, a, a hardware machine, uh, a bioelectrical machine that by default generates uh, a memory of a one-headed pattern, but it's rewritable. And if you rewrite it, it will, uh, it will maintain. So and so this has all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable, but it's uh, got some, it's, it's labile a little bit. It can be rewritten. It has conditional recall, which I just showed you. It has discrete possible behaviors. So what we're doing right now is really trying to use some techniques for, um, from, from connectionist um, uh, machine learning and some other, some other tools of, uh, of, uh, of um, dynamical systems theory and some other things to really pull together what we know about the um, uh, physiology, the electrophysiology of the circuit and the state space of the circuit and the ability of the system to do amazing things like uh, regain specific states if it's pulled out of that condition and also to be rewritable uh, the way that, uh, that, that memory um, in, in real and artificial neural networks is rewritable. Now, we can, now what's interesting is that this memory goes beyond the number, beyond setting the number of heads. It also goes to the uh, it also is involved in, the, in setting the shape of the heads. So this is a perfectly um, uh, normal uh, Duguesia uh, uh, doratocephala with this nice triangular uh, head. And uh, 
what we can do without changing the DNA is cut off the head and then perturb the bioelectric network topology of this of this creature by by blocking the gap junctions for a little bit. Then you let it go and the system settles back down. But when it settles back down, it can make flat heads like a P. felina. It can make round heads like an S. mediterranean, or it can make uh, the, the, you know the, the the normal heads. And so what you see is that, and and by the way, not only not only the the head shape, but actually also the the shape of the brain and the distribution of the stem cells become exactly like these other organisms. Um, they are about 100 to 150 million years evolutionary distance. And so you can ask this the exact same hardware to make heads belonging to other species, so basically other attractors in the state space of this electrical circuit correspond to other species. So evolution can, can, can search the, uh, the, space, the state space of this bioelectrical circuit to derive these other species and it does not uh, it does not require a genetic change, although of course it might become genetically assimilated. Uh, that change may become genetically assimilated um, and then become become heritable. Um, okay, and not only can you find other species in that morphous space, which Darcy Thompson uh, gave us this idea of of a, of, a, of a morphous space, a mathematical morphous space. Um, in that uh, in that uh, morphous space, you can find other things that don't look like planaria at all. You can find these weird spiky forms. You can find these cylindrical things that aren't flat. You can find combinations, sort of hybrid, um, hybrid forms. All of this is done with exactly the same cells. So um, uh, I want to take just uh, just a, a few minutes now to uh, go back to uh, really thinking about the mechanisms of this collective intelligence idea. What I've shown you so far is that uh, individual cells, which are themselves competent to solve problems in transcriptional space, in metabolic space, in a physiological space, are bound together in a multicellular organism to solve anatomical problems, okay? Uh, problems in anatomical morphous space. And then eventually evolution reused it to, for, for, to make brains, to solve behavioral problems, and eventually linguistic space and so on. So, so I want to um, talk for a few minutes about uh, how, how does this scaling work? How do these individual, how do you go from, from, from numerous tiny little, little proto minds to one, uh, one larger um, cognitive uh, system. And so, uh, and so I want to show you some hypotheses about that. Um, in a, uh, uh, in, in, in evolution, what we have through multicellularity is an expansion of goal states. So this, this cell is very good at handling very local goals. It's never going to work towards any other sort of large scale goal, but together in a collective, and I've shown you some evidence that what binds that collective together is electrical uh, communication and the properties of electrical networks, they can work on much bigger goals in a different space. So, so here's the goal of making a limb. And if you've made a limb and I deviate you from that goal, you will use, uh, as, as the cellular collective, you will use energy and very rapidly try to get back to that state. So, so individual cells have no idea what a finger is or how many fingers you're supposed to have or anything like that, but the collective certainly does. And it will keep implementing this under, um, under, under various types of deformations. So that is taking a, a bunch of um, a, a low level minds and making, um, making something that's able to pursue large scale goals in an anatom in a different space in the anatomical space but that uh that uh, set of mechanisms it has a failure mode and that failure mode is known as cancer so this is human glioblastoma in culture and so what's happened to these cells is that they have disconnected from each other electrically and when they do that they roll back down to their unicellular past they no longer are able to be a part of a network that perceives large scale goals. So they, they go back to their early uh, initial goals, which were every cell wants to become two cells and to go wherever life is good. And that's, and that's cancer and metastasis. So we need to understand this process of scaling up and, and, and the various failure modes. And I think that basically what happens is simply um, that, that when you have single cells, they have a little bit of memory going backwards. They have a little bit, and this has been shown in the field of basal cognition, cells have the ability to anticipate future stimuli, but it's quite small, right? Both in space and time, it's quite small. And when you join together into larger networks, you have uh, more computational ability to store past memories. You have more ability to predict future states, and you have a larger spatial perception. You're able to um, uh, collectively measure things on a, on a physically larger scale. And so if this is how collectives form, we ought to be able to use this to address the cancer problem. And in fact, that's, that's, uh, that's what we've done is to say, okay, uh, the oncogene is there. 
we're not going to try to edit the genome or to kill or, or to somehow kill those cells or to remove that, uh, that, that oncoprotein. What we're going to do instead is force those cells to remain in electrical communication with their neighbors, regardless of what the oncogene says. And so when you do that, here's the, the oncoprotein is labeled with red fluorescence. It's very bright. In fact, it's all over the place. You can see this is the same animal. There's no tumor because what we've done is we've co-injected a particular ion channel that sets an electrical state that forces these cells into the normal uh, uh, communication with their neighbors, and they participate in normal morphogenesis. They make skin, they make the various organs, instead of going off on their own and making a tumor. So this is another example of taking advantage of the, of the decision-making at the software level to get a different outcome, even though your hardware is, uh, is, is different, right? And so the, the, we, we've, we've had in our lab many, many examples of, of addressing these kinds of hardware problems uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, um, at the software level by, by exploiting this, uh, this, this collective uh, phenomenon. So what we're interested in is uh, how to, what happens when, when individual, uh, individual cells, which can do this kind of homeostatic loop, how they uh, scale up to be a collective of coupled homeostats that can do very interesting things like navigate problem spaces and so on. And so what you really have here is an expansion of something I call the cognitive light cone. For any being, and this, is, this goes back to my initial uh, stated goal, which is that we want a framework where we can put anything, we can compare anything in the same framework. So whether it's natural, evolved, designed, whatever. So uh, in, uh, in any frame, any, any agent, what, what, what do all uh, cognitive systems uh, have in common? What do all agents have in common? What they have in common is a certain uh, cognitive light cone, which is the spatial and temporal size of the largest goal that they can pursue. So if you uh, can only, uh, if you only uh, care about the local concentration of um, some kind of uh, chemical, and uh, you have a little bit of memory and all, all you're trying to do is optimize your local uh, concent uh, chemical concentration, you might be a bacterium or a tick as far as uh, cogn cognitive uh, light cone size is concerned. So very small. Uh, if you're a dog, you have a bigger cognitive light cone. You have lots more memory going back. You have some predictive ability going future, but you're never going to care about what happens three months from now in a town that's 10 miles over. It's just impossible for, uh, as far as we know, it's impossible for uh, for a dog to have that that large scale of goals and so you have a bigger light cone but it's you know it's still delimited if you're a human you might have you might be working towards goals that are planetary scale for hundreds of uh years into the future in fact past your own lifespan um and so you might have this this enormous cognitive light cone and if you're uh, some sort of a uh, alien being or a future uh, a future uh, human that has uh, has a much bigger uh, cognitive light cone you might um you might be able to uh care, for example, in the linear range about all the living beings on Earth. If humans can't do that. We don't, we don't have the capacity to, to scale our care um, linearly beyond a, you know, some, some small number of concerns. But, but, but there are, could be potentially enormous minds that could, that could literally do that, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, advanced form. So, so, so all of us have these cognitive light cones. And evolution is a journey that of, of, of enlarging these light cones that that then allow us to have bigger goals in different spaces. And of course, we are composite beings full of other uh, uh, organisms, uh, other cells and, and organs and cells, all of which have their own different sizes of light cones in different spaces. So I'm going to end um, in, a, in a couple of minutes uh, with one last thing. I want to show you um, one, uh, one last thing, which is a completely new organism, uh, uh, and, then, and, then I'll, and then I'll finish. So I mean, I have to do a disclosure again because uh, Josh Bongard and I are scientific co-founders of uh, Fauna Systems, which works on uh, computer design synthetic organisms. What we wanted to do was we wanted to ask uh, how much uh, plasticity do cells have to um, navigate their various spaces? Okay, and and what could, could we could we um, liberate uh, wild type cells from their normal uh, normal environment and and ask them to reboot their uh, their their multicellularity. What what would they do? Okay, and so this is this is uh, this is the experiment here. What happens is that um, this is uh, we take um, uh, and this is uh, D D Doug Blackiston and my group uh, did uh, did all the biology for this work, and this was done in in collaboration with uh, Josh Bongard's lab at University of Vermont, and his uh, student Sam Kriegman did all the computational aspects. So so we take we take the uh, the animal cap cells from this early frog embryo. These are skin. These are these are fated to be uh, to be epidermis of various types, and we dissociate them, and then we put them in this little um this little depression, and uh, and we leave them overnight. And you you wonder what might happen. Well, they could die. 
they could spread out, get away from each other. They could form a two-dimensional monolayer the way that cell culture does. Instead, what they do is uh, overnight, this is a time lapse, they coalesce, they come together and they form this little, um, this little circular thing uh, which uh, has an interesting uh, property. We call it a Xenobot because Xenopus Lavis is the name of the frog and it's a biorobotics platform, so it's a biobot. So we call it a Xenobot. What does this Xenobot do? Well, first of all, it swims uh, on its own power. We do not uh, uh, pace it or direct it in any way. How does it swim? You can see that here. It has little hairs. These little hairs are normally used by the frog embryo to distribute mucus on the surface of its body to, to sort of keep the mucus flowing down. But, but this thing, these guys have figured out how to, uh, how to row in opposite directions on either side of, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the structure. And as a result, it, it, can, it can swim. So they can, go, uh, they can go in circles. They can patrol back and forth like this. They can have uh, collective behaviors. Here's, here's a bunch of them. These two are interacting with each other. These guys are sitting there doing nothing. This one is taking a kind of a long journey around the Petri dish. Um, here's one here's one navigating a maze um, what you can see here the water is perfectly still here it will move forward it uh, takes a turn without bumping into the opposite wall and then at this point for some internal reason that, that we don't know it decides to turn around and go back where it came from this is a very uh, simple example of uh, spontaneous self-determined motion there's some kind of process inside that uh, that guides what it does it can take turns it can uh, uh, change uh, change direction and, and, and go back uh, if we scan the um, if we scan the uh, the physiology, this is calcium signaling. So what we're imaging is, is 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 calcium spiking in these cells. What you see is that very much like um, you might see in uh, in brains, uh, you see you see a bunch of calcium spiking. We're currently using all the same techniques that you might use in neuroscience to analyze uh, the information uh, flows here. Uh, in fact, within the within each xenobot, but also between xenobots, who knows? Maybe they're they're um, somehow talking to each other, and you can detect that using information theory approaches. They regenerate. If you cut it in half, they will uh, they will seal themselves back up. So here, so here, it's basically cut in half like this, and then they'll seal themselves back up to a norm to a new uh, xenobot shape. And then here's the most amazing uh, part of all. Uh, it was noticed that when you simulate these bots with objects in their environment, what you find out is that um, actually their their behaviors tend to tend to collect uh, particles into little into little groups, and so. What we decided to do, based on this, uh, based on uh, an AI uh, kind of model of, of of their morphogenesis and behavior, is uh, we decided to give them some actual uh, other cells to play with. And what we found out was was something amazing. Uh, what they do is so so this white stuff here, these are these are loose uh, skin cells. And what the xenobots do is they run around and they collect these skin cells into little balls. And because we're dealing here not with a passive material, but with an agential material, meaning with living cells, the same material that evolution works with. So we as human engineers, the xenobots and evolution, all three of us work with this kind of agential material. And what that allows, it, what, what that allows is that when they do make these uh, little, little balls, overnight the balls themselves mature into the next generation of xenobot, which then will run around and do exactly the same thing. And you get the next generation and the next generation and so on. So think about what this means. We've made it impossible for these guys to reproduce in the normal uh, froggy fashion. Uh, it's just skin. There's no neurons there. There's no reproductive machinery. These are, these are just, just balls of skin, basically. Um, but what they've been able to do is to fulfill von Neumann's dream, which is, to, which is a robot that, that uh, goes around and collects materials from its environment and makes copies of itself. And that's what it does, and we call this kinematic replication. So, um, so, so the, the last the last bit here is simply this. Uh, let's let's think about this for a minute. Um, there's been no genomic editing here. We didn't change the genome. We didn't provide some weird nanomaterial. Uh, when you sequence the genome here, all you see is Xenopus, standard Xenopus lavis. So, so when we ask what does the Xenopus lavis genome actually encode? Well, it encodes cells, it encodes a, a hardware machine that under normal circumstances pr produces this. It produces a set of standard embryonic stages and then some tadpoles that can do this kind of behavior. But under different circumstances, these same cells can solve the problem differently. And uh, they can become a xenobot with its own weird developmental stage uh, and then its own uh, very unusual um, uh, behavior. So as far as we know, no other system does kinematic self-replication. So, uh, so, so here, here are a couple of interesting, interesting things here. Um, first of all, 
this is engineering by subtraction. We didn't add anything, but what we did do was we liberated these cells from the normal influence of the other cells. So if you look at a normal embryo and their skin cells and you ask, what do they know how to do? Well, you say, well, all they can do is be this boring two-dimensional layer sitting on the outside of the animal, keeping out the bacteria. But in fact, uh, what you find out by, by, by putting them on their own is that, yeah, that's normally what they do when they're sort of behavior shaped or bullied by these other cells into, into having that role. But on their own, their default behavior is actually this. So you, you can start to think about evolution as a, as a way of searching the space of behavior shaping stimuli. How do, how do we get cells to tell other cells what to do? And because you're dealing with an agential material, not, uh, not passive Legos, but an agential material, these cells already have certain capacities. You can't just put them where you want and have them stay there. You have to, you have to um, use various signals to get them to, do, uh, to get, get them to change their, their native behaviors. The other thing about this is that for any other living organism, if you ask, why does it have a certain shape, a certain size, uh, uh, certain behaviors, the answer usually is, well, evolution. The anatomical goals come from evolution. You've been selected for eons to be a specific uh, kind of shape. Well, there's never been any xenobots. There's never been any uh, pre uh, evolutionary uh, pressure to be a good xenobot. All of this is completely emergent from the, uh, from the um, uh, gen generic problem-solving capacity of these cells. So one of the things we're working on is, is understanding how it is that evolution makes not just specific solutions to specific environments, but actually problem solving machines that have the capacity to do new things in new environments that they never had specific selection for. Uh, so, um, and, and we're at the moment uh, uh, studying their, their uh, cognitive capacities. We actually have no idea what, what, what can they learn? What do they sense? What are their preferences? All of that um, remains to be, um, to be determined. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end here with two things. First, just a, um, uh, just a summary of, of the kind of philosophical aspects of what I've told you. So, so in my framework, I think that we have to look at uh, agency as a continuum, not binary uh, categories. Uh, and we have to really understand um, how it is that these uh, capacities change when bodies and, and minds change. Uh, I think that persuadability is a, is a useful engineering um, way to organize that axis, which enables what, I, what I've shown you is that it enables uh, important, um, it, it enables new, new discoveries and new capabilities in biomedicine and then so on by thinking about how, how to communicate with these cell groups and so on. I think there's no privileged substrate for cognition. I think that there's nothing magical about, uh, about um, biological substrates. It's, uh, uh, we're going to have intelligences that are, that are extremely um, diverse. Uh, we have this notion of the self uh, described by a cognitive light cone as the, the size of the goal, the largest goal that it's capable of, of pursuing. With this idea of, of evolution and engineers pivoting these systems through different problem spaces, and it doesn't have to be three-dimensional space. When, when we look at how intelligent we think a system is, we're really taking an IQ test ourselves to ask whether we've recognized uh, the space that it's working in, whatever goals it's trying to reach, and its competencies in reaching those goals. Those are not apparent immediately. Like as I showed you for development, it looks like it's uh, always does the same thing, but it's actually much more, much more clever than that. Um, I've shown you that developmental bioelectricity is a evolutionary precursor of, of uh, brain dynamics. And it's basically the physiological medium for the software of multicellular life. It's the, it's the, um, substrate in which the cognition, the, the proto-cognition of um, the morphogenetic uh, swarm intelligence is held. And I've shown you the examples of, of reading and rewriting the memories of that, uh, of that uh, intelligent uh, swarm. And this is just the beginning. These are, these are very early primitive kind of experiments still. And that uh, I think that uh, uh, we have a really uh, interesting implications for evolution here, which is not only uh, due to the multi-scale competency of the organs, you know, you put a bunch of eye cells on the tail and they can still form an eye, they figure out how to connect and the whole thing still, still sort of works. If you have a mouth that's off in the wrong place, it will readjust itself. Uh, so, so this has many implications for, for evolution and, and a really fundamental question of where do these goals come from if it's not just selection. And so the last thing I'm gonna say is this, that, that um, when Darwin uh, said the, the phrase endless forms um, most beautiful when he was, uh, interested uh, and, and, and impressed in the wide variety of, uh, of, of shapes out there in the biological world. All of that is a tiny corner of possible uh, space of agents. 
because biology is highly interoperable. It solves uh, problems uh, that it's never seen before, which means that any combination of evolved material, designed material, and software is some kind of viable agent. So we have hybrids and cyborgs and all kinds of different things that many of these are already being made, but, but some of them will be in the future. And we really need a new kind of ethics to be able to relate to uh, sentient beings that are very different from us. They have a different uh, origin story, they have a different composition, and they have a different kind of, um, uh, kind of intelligence. So um, all of the details are, can be found in these, in these papers, which I'm happy to uh, send to you if anybody's uh, interested. Uh, I want to thank um, all the people that uh, did the uh, that did the work. Um, these are the the postdocs and the students that did all the all the hard work here. Our, our support staff, my many um, collaborators, um, our funders. So uh, many people that have supported this work, and uh, I thank you for listening. <laughs>